In this section, we're going to be discussing what makes a, so a problem a social problem. This is important because a lot of times we talk about problems with the world, but they don't result in actual working towards social change. So the question is, what exactly has to happen to move from just bitching about a problem to actually creating organizations and collecting money and getting um, information out to people and getting people to work towards your um, your goals. Uh, there is a book written by a woman, a sociologist named Donalene Lisecki, who actually outlines what a social problem, a successful social problem claim is by, she looked at a number of successful social problems claims and was able to um, sort of tease out a framework of the things that happen that make a social problem successful. Now understand, we're defining successful as it results in not so much succeeding in changing the problem, but in succeeding in convincing other people that this really is a problem that needs to be addressed by resources. So the first thing that has to happen is that you have to demonstrate that the problem is public that it is not uh, a personal problem or a private problem, but rather a problem that concerns a large group of people. And this is where a lot of political debate in our country is right now, because on the right side of the aisle, we have a lot of people who believe that the um, uh, most of the things that we call problems are things that ought to be solved in, in a private way that should not have government involvement or other kinds of intervention. Where the other side of the aisle, the left side of the aisle, is like, no, no, we have to address this. We have to address it directly. So this, uh, this creates a, a schism in uh, the debates that go on within our political system. And it also creates uh, questions about various charities and uh, social organizations that attempt to make changes. So the first thing to be successful is that you have to convince people that this really is something that should be addressed on a public level. This usually involves uh, developing a set of facts, objective facts that one can point to, uh, usually in the form of numbers, like this affects three out of five people or uh, you know, at a particular rate, a group of people will uh, be involved with this or a percentage or something like that. So um, you, you usually just can't stand up and say, oh, you know, this hurts, and then have uh, a lot of people flock to, um, to your cause. You have to kind of demonstrate uh, through numbers that this cause is affecting a lot of people and um, that it can be measured. Uh, then there is a word that you need to know called typifications. Typifications are like stereotypes in some ways. A stereotype is a kind of typification, but it isn't just limited to stereotypes. Um, but these are basically symbols that people buy into, usually emotionally. So a typification might be um, a starving child. Uh, it might be a, uh, a, a struggling drug addict. It might be a, um, a person who is living on the streets. So there is, you know, there are these kind of symbols or pictures that we have in our head that oftentimes evoked emotional responses from us. And these typifications are often used in convincing other people that this is an important uh, issue that they should be addressing. And then the last thing, um, it's probably overlooked a lot, but it, it definitely has to be part of the equation. There has to be some sort of uneven distribution or division of power. And the reason that we know this is because if people had the power, if the people who had the power actually wanted to change uh, the uh, issue, they would have already done it. So there has to be, you know, a group of people who could make a difference who are not 
making a difference and a, gr a group of people who do not have the power all by themselves to make a difference who are appealing to or struggling to uh, get the people with the power or take the power from the people with the power in order to make that change. So that uneven distribution, that division of power is always going to be a part of this and it needs to be addressed. So how do we construct? The word construct here just simply means uh, putting together a building, a case. How do we construct a social problems claim? Well, there are four elements to this that we're going to go over. Claims, claims making, claims makers, and the audience. So let's address them one at a time. Claims and claims making. Um, a claim has to be measurable to be a successful social problems claim. I'll give you an example. Um, I can make the social problems claim poverty sucks. And, you know, that wouldn't be that hard to convince people of, but it really isn't going to result in a lot of action because it is not measurable. How much does it suck? Does it suck more this year than it did last year? Will it suck less if we do this? How do we measure that? We can't. So a more uh, convincing social problems claim was made by uh, a Nobel Peace Prize winner named Muhammad Yunus, who said poverty is the result of a lack of assets. Uh, he made this claim and then he started something called micro-lending uh, in which he set up banks where people in developed countries could invest money and uh, give loans to people in developing countries and this would lift them out of poverty. So it's very easy to measure well, it's not easy, but it's very possible to measure uh, somebody's uh, assets, how much they own, whether or not they are increasing their assets. All of these things are possible. So that measurable claim got to a cause of poverty and was easy to capture uh, the audience's imagination with how to go about knowing whether they were making a difference. There also usually is a certain amount of panic or worry or fear in claims making. And this is because you've got to, you know, get attention in a very competitive uh, situation because there are a lot of people making claims out there, a lot of people trying to get attention. And as such, then you want to, you know, you want to be the one who is most urgent, the one that needs the most attention right now. And this leads to constructing two things. One is sympathetic victims. Sympathetic victims are victims who essentially are being hurt through no fault of their own. And this is why probably the uh, most successful social problems claims in some way or another will, um, will include the impact on children because children are very sympathetic victims. They uh, are not perceived as uh, being uh, a victim by their own means. They're perceived as innocent. And then you also need unsympathetic villains. Uh, unsympathetic villains are usually not going to be persons because a person is multifaceted and you can think, oh my God, this person, this thing is evil, and then you meet the person and he's a really nice guy. Uh, there's a film, a uh, documentary film called The Corporation that has this really great scene in it where this group is going to the CEO's house of British Petroleum or Shell, I think it was Shell Oil, and so they're going to the CEO's house of Shell, the CEO of Shell Oil, his house in a London suburb. And they get there, and the first thing that happens is it turns out to be this little suburban home in a cul-de-sac. So it's not a big mansion. I mean, this guy's a billionaire or multimillionaire. And then while they're protesting at this cul-de-sac with the signs and everything, the wife of the CEO comes out and offers them tea and cookies and 
um, the guy comes out and he's like your uncle, right? He's this nice guy. And so it just sort of took the entire wind out of the protest because, you know, it turns out that the CEO of this big bad oil company is actually a human being who lives in a nice little suburb who is, you know, very friendly and wants to listen to you. So you're going to be more successful if you paint um, institutions or ideas as the villain rather than individuals. There are few people in the world who are truly uh, completely unsympathetic. And so generally these are not persons but rather ideas or institutions so you know an unsympathetic villain is a like a you know a multinational corporation you hear that a lot you don't talk about specific companies or specific CEOs or board of directors but rather the sort of vague but uh, menacing uh, multinational corporation uh, and then you also have to have some sort of solution uh, in your implied in your claim people have to get a sense that if they listen to you and start worrying about this that there is some hope of solving it and then finally there has to be some sort of call to action you need to be you know saying okay this is a problem and what you need to do is give us money or this is a problem and what you need to do is sign this petition or this is a problem and what you need to do is volunteer your time you know, we bitch about a lot of things in the world, and if you don't have this call to action in it, the claims are probably going to just come across as complaints rather than as something that will lead to actual social change. You also have to have the right spokesperson for your, uh, for your claim. And uh, the, the best spokespersons are going to be credible, uh, you know, they're going to have some believability to them. They're going to get the attention of the people that you want uh, to pay attention. Uh, and so the three biggest claims makers that usually succeed are victims. When victims discuss what has happened to them, it's very hard to say to them, oh, it doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, I don't believe you, those kind of things. So victims are an important claims maker. Experts, especially if you have like a scientific side to something or a, a particular kind of research that has been done that supports your uh, claim. It's always good to have, you know, somebody with credentials, somebody with experience, somebody who's done the research to stand up and point to this and say, you know, this is what needs to change. And then a group that is not necessarily more credible, but they are certainly capable of being more believable and they will definitely get more attention are celebrities. So quite a few causes and ideas out there are supported by celebrities and this helps make them more successful. <coughs> and then finally, you have to have the right audience. The right audience for your claim is going to be the audience that has the most power to actually make the change. So if you want to change a law, your audience is going to be lawmakers. Uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving is a very successful social problems claim campaign and they um, started out with the claim that the, the laws that were on the books about drunk driving were not being enforced. And so they were talking about law enforcement. And because they were talking about law enforcement, the first thing that they did is they went to police departments and judges with information educating them across the country, saying to them, you know, we need to basically um, uh, really enforce the laws that are on the books. So they went to the right people, the right audience, and that's how they uh, successfully push forward their social problems claim. The audience needs to be convincible. You're not going to be arguing with your enemies. You're not going to be trying to convince people who have no sympathy towards your cause. You've got to, you know, pick people who are going to be interested and listen to it. 
and then it's not going to be the general public a lot of people this is where they fall apart they think we've got to convince everybody or we've got to convince you know a whole lot of people you might use the general public to convince the lawmaker or to convince the policy maker or whatever to help you put pressure on it but the ultimate audience is going to be whoever has the power to change things so probably on a test somewhere they'll be something about not general public as a good audience.